morning everyone we are into the last sunday of october and we just left for two more months for the new year to come in and i am just so excited about the last two months because it's a time when there is christmas there's a lot of sharing there's a lot of you know people going home visiting homes it's it's just a fun and happy time and i'm just excited about this entire season and today before we go into anything i would like to just sing a few lines of a song titled still which is a hill song and post that we just go go ahead when the oceans rise in thunder's roar and i will soar with you above the storm father you are king over the flood i will be still and know you So as the song says friends we worship a very mighty powerful god who is in control of all the things that happen around us and sometimes we might be worried this morning we might be you know thinking about all the problems that happened last week but let me just assure you that the god we worship this morning knows all that is going in our heart and let's read a scripture from Psalms 46 and it says this God is our refuge and strength and ever ever present help in trouble therefore we will not fear though the earth give away though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the most high dwells and coming down to verse 7 the lord almighty is with us the, the god of jacob is our fortress Come and see what the Lord has done this desolation he has brought on the earth he makes war cease to the ends of the earth he make breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire and was then it says he says be still and know that i am god i will be exalted among the nations i will be exalted in the earth friends Let us trust this God who is who is worthy of all praises who is almighty all powerful and he says just be still and know that I am God whatever worries we might be going through be it our job our financial problems our mental health our physically we are struggling with something let us just submit everything to God this morning and give our whole heart as we grow in our learning and understanding towards God let's bow down our heads and pray Father God we're just so grateful for this beautiful beautiful morning you've given us father it's just a fresh new start for us where we could just forget about the past and just come towards you and just worship and honor you father we just pray that help us to trust in you completely father whatever problems whatever worries we might be going through just help us to submit everything to your hands and give our full heart as we worship you this morning thank you so much for being with us as we take part in the communion help us to remember the cross help us to remember that jesus died for my sins on that cross thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity all the i pray in your son's precious name amen let's have a beautiful sunday service ahead Oh
hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, he slipped my sword to answer him, be truly in my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. Christ was born across the sea With a glory in his bosom That transfigures you and me As he died to make men holy Let us live to make men free While God is marching on Glory, glory, hallelujah Sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore Very deeply stained within, singing to rise no more But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry From the waters lifted me, now safe am I Love lifted me, love lifted me When nothing else could have love lifted me Love lifted me, love lifted me Live ever his praise and sing Love so mighty and so true Merits my soul's best songs Faithful loving service to to him belongs Love lifted me Love lifted me When nothing else can have Love lifted me Love lifted me Love lifted me Above Jesus completely saves, He will lift you by His love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows His will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could have love lifted me, love lifted me. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And dark at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God Yeah.
Good morning brothers and sisters. This is the time of communion where we will be reflecting on our own hearts. So let's turn our Bible to Luke chapter 23 and we'll read verse 18 to 25. And it says, but the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" For the third time, he spoke to them, "Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him." But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. and their shout 
prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant them their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So here's the scenario. The Jewish leader had brought the Lord Jesus before Pilate for him to be sentenced to death. Now this is the second time the Lord has been brought before Pilate. Pilate does not want to harm Jesus because he knows that he is innocent. But the Jews are also pressurizing him. And so to bring in a, compro- a compromise, Pilate present, presents Barabbas to the crowd and asks them to choose whom they would like to set free. Now Barabbas was a, was a really evil guy. He was arrested because he was a rebel and had committed several murders. And what wrong did did the Lord do? He healed people. He loved them. He did nothing but, but good. His only crime was that he loved hell-bound sinners and transformed them into saints. But who did the crowd choose? They chose Barabbas. Such was their hatred for the one who loved them so much that they would rather accept a horrible criminal than him. Barabbas is set free and he walks down to his people and the Lord kept silent because the Lord Jesus knew that God would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so so that he can treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought that it was the people who set him free. No, no, no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. And you know, brothers and sisters, when I when I think of this passage, I realized who this Barabbas really is. He's me. He's you. He's us. We are Barabbas who have rebelled against God and have committed several murders in our hearts when we have hated our brothers and sisters for no reason. We are Barabbas. But still the father loved Barabbas. And even though Barabbas might never turn away from his sin and turn to God in repentance, he still loved him. And he loved him so much that he gave his only son. What would have happened if Jesus was released instead of Barabbas? The story would have been completely different and there would have been no way for us to be saved. But by rejecting his only and only begotten son, Jesus, the father was able to accept Barabbas. And the obedient son took upon himself the wrath that was reserved for for all the world so that we can have the hope for salvation. And communion is a time where we are giving an opportunity to reflect on what God has done for us and then be grateful for it. The bread that we are about to break represents the body of Christ that was broken for us and the grape juice represents his blood. Let's pray for the communion. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. You already knew that humans are weak and you have to do something to save us from this pain. You have lavished your great love on us. We can't be enough thankful for Jesus, whose blood cleanses us from all our impurities. Thank you for giving another chance to get repent and come closer to you. Help each one of us to live a pure and holy life in this crooked generation. We plead before you for every sin that we did against you and only you, my Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can conquer sin in our life. I make this small prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
brothers and sisters now is the time of giving let's see what early churches used to do in acts chapter 2 verse 44 and 45 and it says all the believers were together and have everything in common they sold property and possession to give to anyone who had need wow but today i'm not asking you to sell your property or give your whole salary although we can give something of what god has blessed us with i'm sure god has given us much more without asking so let's give freely brothers and sisters let's pray for the contribution heavenly father father thank you so much for blessing us with so many things we pray at this time of giving use this collection lord to glorify your name may the poor be taken care of help us father to be more generous we love you father in jesus name i pray amen Good morning church. Today is the last Sunday of the month of October. Just two more months are left and then Jan 1st, 2022. Oh man. 10 months have just flown by. And another good news is that, you know, Mumbai is relaxing some of the restrictions for restaurants and shops and movie theaters. and the number of covid cases are also declining so that is good but please please get yourselves fully vaccinated the virus is still out there and you can still get very ill if you catch covid so once again please ensure that you get vaccinated okay so last week i spoke to you on acts chapter 24 and today it is the first 12 verses of acts chapter 25 So let me just give you a recap or a summary of what we have learned so far. So Felix, who was the governor of the province of Judea, is now gone and is replaced by Festus. And his replacement, that is Festus has come. Felix, as we all know, was a procrastinator. He kept delaying the release of Paul. You know, Paul's accusers in chapter 24 could not give any evidence for their charges. And so Paul should have been released by now by Felix. And another thing that we learned about Felix was that, you know, he wanted a bribe from Paul, and so he would often call him to talk to him expecting some bribe. But on the other side, he also wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, and so he kept this enemy in prison. Okay? So that's how much we saw last Sunday. So today we are looking into Acts chapter 25. And my first point for today is the slavery of sin. So let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 25 and we'll read verses 1 to 3. Festus then, having arrived in the province, 3 days later went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul. that he might have him brought to Jerusalem at the same time setting an ambush to kill him on the way so as we saw last sunday that felix has been replaced by festus now why was felix replaced this was because rome had come to know that under the rule of felix the whole province of judea had become a mess you know felix was not able to handle this province He had no experience. He had no training. He just got the job as we saw last Sunday because of his brother's recommendation. And so naturally, riots were going on everywhere. Villages were being burned, looted, and plundered all over the place. And there was a lot of unrest in the province of Judea. So, naturally, Rome recalled him in dishonor in AD 59. and replaced him with a man named Porcius Festus 
Okay, that was his full name. So we don't know much about this guy, but uh, Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, says about Festus that he was an improvement compared to Felix. You know, he was better than Felix, and that he was a by the book governor. Okay, so that's all that we know about Festus. So Festus arrives on the scene in Caesarea, which was the Roman headquarters back then, and he spends three days there. You know, getting himself up to speed regarding what was going on in this province. You know, getting to know the nature of his new job, and in just three days' time, he realizes that he needs to go to Jerusalem. Okay, that's how bad the situation in Jerusalem was. The hatred that these people had towards Felix and towards the Romans was really great, and so Festus realized that he needs to go up to Jerusalem so that he can meet up with the Jewish leaders over there and work on building, you know, a, a warm working relationship with them. And so he leaves for Jerusalem. And what does Luke say happens after that? Three days later, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. And the chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul, requesting a concession against Paul, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem. At the same time, setting an ambush to kill him on the way. Now, brothers and sisters, here's something that we need to really understand. Okay, uh, if you are holding your physical Bible in your hand, and your hand is on the page where chapter 24 ends. And chapter twenty-five starts. Take a look at that small gap between the two chapters. That gap, that little gap, represents two whole years. For these two years, Paul has been in prison, and that may seem, you know, sad to us. But what I feel more sad about is that even after these two years. These Jewish men are trying to get Paul. Now I just want that to sink in, because that says something to us about hate in the human heart, that it can go so deep that you don't think clearly anymore. You just want to fulfill your agenda. You don't care what it takes. You hate somebody, and it goes so deep that two years later. You can't just let this go. You know they're after him, and they want him dead. They want him ambushed, and they'll do anything they can to kill Paul the apostle. You know they have no charges. You know we've already seen、uh, Paul getting tried twice, right? And he's going to be tried a third time now in these few verses that we are going to cover this Sunday, and again a fourth time in the rest of the chapter we are going to look at. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the slavery of sin, and it is scary. It shows how history tends to repeat itself. Let me explain, okay? In John chapter eight, verses thirty-one. The Lord tells to the Jews who had believed in Him, okay, He says this: If you hold on to My teaching, you really are My disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered Him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You know, here in this passage, the Jews were wrong about something because you know they had been slaves for four hundred years in Egypt, and yet they tell that we are Abraham's descendants and we have never been slaves to anyone. <laughs> but then Jesus does not contradict them, but he tells them that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. You know, brothers and sisters, here is the thing. You know, today in the name of freedom and in the name of rights, people want to live by their own standards and ignore God's moral laws. You know, God's standards for our lives. 
You know, today's generation thinks that indulging in sins like premarital sex and living relationship is a sign of freedom. The world views abortion as a sign of being free. Giving bad words in friend circle is seen as a sign of being free. But God and his words are clear about what is right and what is wrong, about what is good and what is bad, about light and darkness. It's all spelled out for us in the Bible. But truth be told, the world and its desires seem very attractive to us. In the way that the culture is moving today seem very attractive to us, especially the youth in our church. We are bombarded by these sinful ideas in the form of Bollywood songs, Bollywood films, Hollywood films, all these banners and posters, you know, that is spread out all around us. They all preach the same message to rebel against God and they name it as freedom. Brothers and sisters, we are in a war, a war for our souls. There is a battle going on and if you cannot see that, there's a big chance that you've been blinded by the world. So let me ask you brothers and sisters, what sin are enslaving you today? What sin are you a slave to? What are you struggling with today? Do you have something against someone, you know, for the last two years and you cannot let it go? Are you finding it difficult to overcome any sin? Are you chained by lust, greed, immorality? How about anger, bitterness, laziness? Have you fallen captive to something that no one knows about in your life? But brothers and sisters, if you are enslaved to something, here is the good news. The Lord Jesus promises us freedom. Jesus spoke to the Jews who believed in him and he said, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs it forever. And so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Brothers and sisters, true freedom is only found in Christ. The man who is a slave to Christ is the freest man in the entire world. So I beg you today, don't fall for the things of this world, no matter how attractive they may seem to you. Come to Christ. There is freedom in Him. There is freedom in Him. And for that to happen, to be truly free in Christ, you must walk in the light or come into the light. Let's read 1 John chapter 1, verses 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. So brothers and sisters and my dear friends, are you enslaved to something today? To a particular sin? Come to Christ. He will set you free. Do not be a slave to sin. Amen? Okay, so let's move forward to our second point for today. The sovereignty of God. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 25 and continue reading from verses 4 to 5. Festus then answered that Paul was being kept in custody at Caesarea and that he himself was about to leave shortly. Therefore, he said, let the influential men among you go there with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. Amen. So Governor Festus was not as naive or stupid as the Jewish leaders thought. Okay, so he says, look, I'm going to leave Paul in Caesarea. Okay, I'm not going to bring him here. But rather, 
I am going down there. And to which he adds, Therefore, let the influential men among you go there with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man, let them prosecute him. You know, I don't know if he had any suspicion against uh, Jewish leaders. You know, I don't know about that. But he wants to do things right. Okay, he wants to do it in a right way. And this shows us that, you know, he was a very credible character. But let me tell you something. Okay, when you look at the evidences that are presented in this passage, it's amazing. You know, it's shocking that Festus didn't take Paul to Jerusalem. You know, I mean, it's not that difficult to move Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem, right? And more than anything else, what does Festus wants to do? He wants to build a good relationship with the Jewish leaders, right? And so it would seem like a good idea to listen to them and to take Paul to Jerusalem. And then again, another thing is that he personally didn't know Paul. So, you know, why should he care for him so much? So, why didn't Festus send Paul to Jerusalem? I'll tell you why he didn't do that. It was the providence and the sovereignty of God. Brothers and sisters, what we need to realize here is that Festus is not the one running the show here. You know, neither are the Jewish leaders running the show here. God is in charge and he is in control of everything. So now let me tell you something that can help you, you know, worry less about what's going on around you. Okay. Did you know that God ordains the attitudes and actions of men to bring about his own ends? Let me rephrase that. Did you know that God is in control and he ordains the attitudes and action of men so that his will, his holy and perfect will is accomplished? God is in control. You know, even in the government, did you know who was really coordinating the last election that we had? God was. Okay, to that you might ask, so you're trying to tell me that, you know, God got those people elected in the office? Absolutely. Now, we may not understand why God does what he does, but one thing we can do is that we can trust him. You know, let me give you an example. You know the incident where the Lord Jesus was before Pontius Pilate and uh, even after all the allegations that were brought before him, the Lord Jesus stood silent. To which Pilate tells him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize that I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And the Lord replies, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. What is the Lord saying here? He's saying to Pilate, You know something, Pilate? You are not in charge of this operation here. God is. Let me give you another example. Okay? You remember in Acts chapter 2 verses 22, what, what does it say? Okay, these are the words of Peter. He says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you selves know. This man, now listen to this carefully, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You know, Pilate and the Jewish leaders were only carrying out the plan that God had planned out and ordained. God was in control when the Lord Jesus was being crucified to death. Again, in Genesis chapter 45, you know what happened, right? You remember that the brothers of Joseph sold him into slavery, right? They sold him to a caravan going to Egypt and then he wound up in Egypt, then with Potiphar, and then with the Pharaoh and became a ruler, right? And his brothers arrived and then Joseph talks to his brothers and look what he says in Genesis chapter 45 verses 7. He says, God sent me before you 
to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. So who do you think really got Joseph into Israel? Not his brothers. God did. And do you know what would have happened if Joseph had never gotten into Egypt? All of his brothers may have died in a famine that came and the messianic line, you know, the lineage of Jesus Christ would have ended with that. So God to preserve the messianic line had to preserve that family. And so God sent Joseph in advance to Egypt to make sure that when the famine came, Joseph would have Egypt all stacked up with enough extra wheat. Okay. Now notice in verse 8 what does Joseph say Now therefore it was not you who sent me here but God You know it doesn't get as plain as that brothers and sisters that's providence God using the natural circumstances in the world to bring about his supernatural desires In Daniel chapter 4 verses 25 Daniel tells these words to King Nebuchadnezzar the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. You know, he's telling the king that all the people who are kept in authority, all the kings, all the politicians who are there in the world, they have been placed there because God chose them to be there, to bring about his own plans. And then by the end of that chapter, this is what Nebuchadnezzar himself says about the Lord. Okay, His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? You know, God is the author of everything. He is the creator God. He sees everything from the beginning to the end. In other words, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows the choices that you will make. He is God. He set the rulers in the nations. So who is running the politics of India? God is. He is in charge. And this, brothers and sisters, is the sovereignty of God which many theologians today agree upon that this is one of the most vital and fundamental and important attribute of our God. One of the most important characteristic of our God. So why should we know the sovereignty of our God? We should know this because it fills us with great hope knowing that everything that we are going through today has been ordained by the sovereign God. Yes, even the pain that you are going through, even the loss that you are experiencing, it was all in accordance to the will of God. Why? So that he can conform you more into the image of his son. That we may become more like the Lord Jesus. Oh, what a great rest we can find for our souls by knowing that even the pain and the hurt that is being dealt to us today is because God has ordained it for us. It's not meaningless. The suffering that we are going through is not meaningless. And of course you can't see what good it is doing for you today. But on that day, when we'll be in heaven, face to face with our Savior, and we'll know all that there is to know, these sufferings and pain that makes you cry today will become a cause of joy and you will praise God with the loudest praise. Praising God that if I had not gone through that suffering on that day, this good would not have happened to me. And so we should find great comfort and rest in this that our God is the sovereign God. You know, just like Charles Spurgeon once said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you can lay your head. You can rest in Him. 
you can rest in his sovereignty and i believe that this is what kept paul going even when things seemed hopeless he trusted and he rested in the sovereignty of god so why didn't festus do what the jewish leaders wanted because god was in control and if paul had gone to jerusalem at that time that would have been an ambush and paul would have been killed and god didn't want that to happen you know why because god had made a promise to paul that he'll get him into rome you see that that's the sovereignty of god brothers and sisters okay so now let's move on ahead to the third point for today to the final point for today the impact of one life let's read acts chapter 25 verses 6 to 12 after he had spent not more than 8 or 10 days among them he went down to caesarea and on the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered paul to be brought after paul arrived the jews who had come down from jerusalem stood around him bringing many and serious charges against him which they could not prove while paul said in his own defense i have committed no offense either against the law of the jews or against the temple or against caesar but festus wishing to do the jews a favor answered paul and said are you willing to go up to jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges and paul said i am standing before caesar's tribunal where i ought to be tried i have done no wrong to the jews as you also very well know if then i am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death i do not refuse to die but if none of those things is true of which these men accuse me no one can hand me over to them i appeal to caesar then when festus had confirmed with his counsel he answered you have appealed to caesar to caesar you shall go amen so about 8 to 10 days have gone by and paul is standing trial for the third time in the last two chapters and again the jewish leaders bring forth their allegations and you know i can just imagine paul standing in the corner you know rolling his eyes because he's he's heard all these allegations before okay there's nothing new and again we see that they can't provide actual witnesses who accused him on that first day you remember this was when paul was in the temple and the jews from asia who were there thought that paul had brought trophimus the ephesian into the inner courts of the temple now the jews from asia had gone back to asia okay the ones who originally made that complaint they've gone back to asia they're no longer here okay so there are no eye witnesses and so paul answers for himself in this way i have committed no offense either against the law of the jews or against the temple or against caesar and this is something very important brothers and sisters in the book of acts every time the disciples were brought before the court they were always innocent you know the jews would have plenty of allegations but no evidence to prove them and before the law the disciples were ruled out as innocent even the roman emperors who knew nothing about the faith would rule these men out as innocent you know this is what peter says in first peter chapter 3 verses 13 to 17 who was there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good but if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness you are blessed and do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled but sanctify Christ as lord in your hearts always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that in the thing which you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame for it is better if god should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong and so we've seen that paul is doing exactly what first peter 3 verses 13 to 17 says okay and because of that 
Festus is stuck. He knows that Paul is innocent and he doesn't want to sentence him to death because he knew that if he did, he would be guilty of killing an innocent Roman citizen. And that would mean that if an inquiry is done regarding this situation, then he would be dead too because he has killed an innocent Roman citizen, which was against the Roman law. Okay, so he doesn't want to sentence Paul to death, but he also doesn't want to upset the Jews. He wants their friendship, no? And so he comes up with a compromise. He says, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? You know, Festus is saying, see, the Jewish leaders want you to go to Jerusalem and they want to judge you. Okay, but uh, we won't do that. You go to Jerusalem and I will be your judge. Sounds good. But by this time, Paul is just fed up. Okay, he knows that he's innocent and Festus also knows that he's innocent and he should be released. And Paul knows that going to Jerusalem means a certain death. And so now he says, look, I am a Roman citizen. I stand before Caesar's judgment seat. And if you've got a case, then prosecute the case. But if you don't have a case against me, forget it. You know, I've done nothing against the Jews. And he says to Festus, hey, you know this very well, Festus. I am innocent here. Okay. And then he says that I'm not trying to escape death here. Okay. That is not the issue. And, you know, that is very true over here, right? Because Paul didn't care about dying even for a bit. Okay, dying was just like a promotion for him. You know, that's why he says, for me to die is gain, right? So he says that it isn't death that I'm trying to avoid here. It's justice that I am longing for, that I am after. Brothers and sisters, let us remind ourselves here again that Paul is talking to a Roman governor here. You know, he's not just talking to a random person on the street. You know, these words are really, you know, bold and they are really courageous, right? And if you think that this is courageous, then wait for what he said next. Okay, he says, I appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul knew that he was getting nowhere in Caesarea. Okay, he was stuck in the political battle that was going on and he was the victim of the whole thing. And so he says, I appeal to Caesar. And the very moment he said that, the case shifted out of the hands of Festus into the hands of Caesar, who was in Rome. And now I can imagine in a sense, you know, that Paul must have got really excited on the inside when he said that. Because he knew that, you know, back in Acts chapter 23 verses 11, when he was sleeping in that night in the cell, the Lord came to him and said, you know, hey, don't be discouraged. You've been faithful in preaching the gospel here and your next stop is in Rome. You remember that, right? So he knew that God was getting him there. And when he finally said the words that, you know, I appeal to Caesar, you know, he must have been really excited. You know, his heart must be pumping and thumping right now, realizing that this was his ticket to Rome. And Luke says that when Festus had confirmed with his counsel, he answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. You know, Festus had to check with his Roman council to find out if Paul had Roman citizenship and that, you know, he was legitimate to make the appeal. And so he says, okay, you have appealed to Caesar, you are going to Caesar. And, you know, you can just imagine Paul's heart going crazy. Rome, at last, I am going to Rome. Th this was really on Paul's mind for a very long time. And he had written about it in Romans chapter 1 verses 11 to 15. Let's read that. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also 
who are in Rome. You know, he had this desire for a very long time in his heart. And finally, it was coming true. And now, all of a sudden, his heart must be thumping. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. I'm going to Rome. Imagine his excitement, brothers and sisters here. So, let me just give a confusion here. All right. There are times in our lives where we ask this question. Okay. Probably to someone else or even to ourselves. The question that what can one man do? You know, what difference can one man make in this big world? And to that, I would say that if we look long enough at Paul's life, we can clearly see what one man can do. He affected everybody. From the simplest man walking down the street to the guards stationed at the palace of Rome. And his effect was so great, any man who would meet Paul would for the most part have one of the two reactions. They would either bow down their knees to the Lord Jesus or they would turn back and try to kill Paul. Isn't that right? In Paul's life, we can see the impact of one totally dedicated life. Only eternity, brothers and sisters, will be able to measure the impact of that one man. And I was thinking while preparing this sermon that I know that I could never have the impact that Paul had on this world. But this is my prayer, you know, and this is my prayer for each and every one of us that we would be able to maximize whatever impact we can have on this world. That we would set in order our priorities. That we would maximize our time. And that doesn't mean that we run around doing as much as work as possible. No. But rather it means that we find out the priorities in our lives that really matter and then work accordingly. Maybe the best way that you can maximize your life is to pour it out on three other people who will be able to multiply it in the future. You know, I don't know. But all I know is as Christians, we ought to realize that one man can affect a whole world if that man is right before God, being completely sold out for him. And that ought to be a challenge for each and every one of us today. Two months are left for this year to end. How are you going to make sure that you make an impact on this world? Always remember, brothers and sisters, that the sovereign Lord is working in your life and mine to do his will. So let's respond to his calling and live our lives for his glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. And with that, we have covered the first part of Acts chapter 25. Next Sunday, we are going to cover the next half of Acts chapter 25. And then there are just a few more chapters left for the series to end. But I really hope that you are getting encouraged and convicted and challenged by this series that we are having on the Book of Acts. Please continue to revisit these podcasts and these messages because every time you do, you will take something new to learn. Now before we end the podcast for today, let's have a final song. And I'll be seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place, right here on YouTube. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Amen. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, 
to God from all of 